Merry Christmas, everybody. Christmas is over. You missed it. Of course I did. Freaking God. Happy New Year, everybody. It's January 11th. Close enough. Hello and welcome to the Z-Man Show, where it's finally 2019, which means it's probably a little too late for me to be doing a list of the top games from 2018. Doing it anyway. So instead of doing a traditional top 10 list, I'm going to limit myself to five games, basically because I didn't play as many games as I wish I had this year. Instead of having some of the later games on the list be mediocre titles, I'm going to focus on fewer games that better represent what ended up being a very good year for video games, for the most part. The rules are simple. Only games from the calendar year of 2018, and only games that I have either played or played enough to get a really good opinion of. And if you enjoy the video, make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you're notified of future Z-Man Show episodes. Like next week, when I'm going to talk about my most anticipated games for 2019. Two weeks after the year began. So, without further ado, these are my top five favorite games of 2018. Number five. There's not much better than getting together with a group of friends for a game of Smash Brothers, and Super Smash Brothers Ultimate is the best way to experience that. This game is truly the ultimate version of this long-running series and is perfectly at home on the Nintendo Switch. Every character from any Smash Brothers game is here, including fun new additions like Ridley and Simon Belmont. There are tons of characters and stages to choose from, so much variety that you can play this game for hours and not see the same combinations. On top of that, the game fixed a lot of the things that the Wii U version did wrong. Menus are greatly improved, final smashes are quicker to the punch, and the addition of the final smash bar allows these fun ultimate moves to be seen without the need to play with items. Single player content is adequate. Some modes like spirits are boring and not worth your time, while classic mode is very well thought out and fun. There's even a new World of Light mode that I haven't even gotten to play yet, but I plan on doing so on stream at twitch.tv slash zmanshow, so you can go follow along and watch. All this put together, Smash might be the most moment-to-moment -moment fun game that I could put on this list. And for a guy like me who's really into single-player story-based games, to have it on my list shows just how special this game really is. Number 4 Red Dead Redemption 2 is an absolute masterpiece of a game that just barely missed the mark for me. Rockstar put together an incredibly realized world with beautiful scenery, impressive detail, and what feels like a living, breathing countryside. But in their push for realism, I feel they went a little too far in some places. Hunting and gathering, weapon management, survival aspects, and just the overall movement of the characters feels off from how I'd like the game to play. That's not to take away from this fantastic story and these strong characters, but many of the moments between the story wore on me, and it's taking me a lot longer to finish this game than I'd like. But despite all the things that bother me, I can't say that this game didn't accomplish something truly spectacular in the realm of video games, which is why it makes number four on my list. Number 3 Marvel's Spider-Man might be the most purely fun game on this list. It is fun to be Spider-Man. It is fun to web-sling around New York City. It is even fun to see everyday Peter Parker's interactions with his friends and colleagues. Spider-Man is one of my favorite superheroes, and this game nailed Spider-Man. Yuri Lowenthal killed it as Peter Parker, from the quips to the more serious and emotional, and even sometimes too real moments of the game. But it's the web-slinging where the game really shines. The traversal in this game has a real sense of fluidity to it that no Spider-Man game has hit, not even Spider-Man 2. Fighting feels a little bit off if you played the Arkham games like I have, but once you get used to the mechanics, it becomes a surprisingly deep and frantic system. Where this game falls short of the best is the character designs. I think the Spider-Man suit looks fantastic, but the other character models just aren't quite up to snuff with some of the other games on this list, in my opinion. 
There were also a few glitches that I ran into that semi hampered my experience with this game, but it's not nearly enough for me not to love this game and to make sure that it's number three on my list. Number two. It's difficult to explain the way I feel about Celeste. In simple terms, it's very much an indie game made by a very small team, and therefore has a very compact feeling about it. But the way it uses its time to tell a journey that is important, while also giving tight and well-designed gameplay is transcendent. It almost feels like a disservice to talk about the elements of story, character, and gameplay separately because they feel so intermingled. Story-wise, you have this journey by a girl, Madeline, to climb Celeste Mountain as a way to reset a life that's been troubling her. Along the way, she runs across room after room of increasingly difficult platforming challenges with tantalizing rewards designed only to increase that challenge. The player is expected to die a lot in this game, which is okay because the game's reset is so quick that you can try again immediately. No room is ever a challenge that you think you can't overcome with at least one more try or from a different angle or with a slightly different timing. I mean, I'm a player that can get frustrated with we expect you to die type games, but Celeste never frustrated me. And the platforming challenge fits right in with the character of Madeline. She's a character at this mountain seeking challenge, telling herself that if she can do this one thing, everything in her life will feel better. I don't know about you, but that's a thought I've constantly had in my life. But just completing a challenge or an obstacle doesn't inherently mean things get better. And that's something that I definitely learned throughout the eight chapters of this game. It's difficult to explain the way that I feel about Celeste. It might just be as simple as being a very fun game that feels important. And that's why it's number two on this list. Number one. It's interesting how for the second year in a row, my game of the year comes from an established franchise that reinvented itself in a dramatic way but managed to keep the heart of what the series is. I played the first God of War on the God of War collection, as well as chunks of two and three and Ascension, and I liked them. They were good games. Not great, but good. So when the PS4 reboot of God of War was announced at Sony's E3 2016 press conference, I was absolutely blown away. I could see immediately what Sony Santa Monica was trying to do with the game. Kratos was going to have some true character development, something that he'd really not had before. What I was delivered was somehow even further beyond my expectations. The story is phenomenal. The interactions between Kratos and his son Atreus feel real, and watching Atreus grow up and Kratos change in his ways throughout the journey is entertaining to watch. But it's not just those two. The secondary characters are interesting and funny, and considering there aren't that many characters in the game, varied. I remember all of them. Brock, Sindri, the Witch of the Woods, Mimir, even the World Serpent has a character to him. You can really feel the importance to both Kratos and Atreus on the mission that they have been given. And it's impressive how the game keeps the scale of a God of War game, but still feels like such a subdued game. And I haven't even mentioned the gameplay yet. The combat is frantic and fun. The RPG elements, which are equipment based, change the way that you go through combat. Fighting mooks is fun. The boss fights are scaled back, but in a way feel more epic because of it. And the optional boss fights in the game are some of the most fun challenges I've ever had. It didn't matter how many times I died, I could not leave the boss room without overcoming that challenge, learning the pattern and gotten the loot that comes along with it. If there's one negative I have to press on this game, and it is minor, the camera can be a little too close at times, and you can get hit out of nowhere but it's so infrequent and easy to come back from that it never really frustrated me. If you can't tell, I thoroughly enjoyed this game and can't wait for the inevitable sequel, which is why this is my game of the year. So that was my list. Maybe you agreed, maybe you disagreed. Maybe you're wondering why your favorite game wasn't on the list. Well, that's because Detective Pikachu wasn't the masterpiece you thought it was, Todd.